Good afternoon. I'm Julie Skosky James, Vice President of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us today for this virtual lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jana Meyer. Jana is Associate Curator of Collections at the Filson Historical Society. She received a degree in history from the University of Louisville, as well as a master's degree in library and information sciences from the University of Kentucky. Jana specializes in arranging and describing the Filson's manuscript collections and cataloged Dorothy Joseph's papers in 2017. Please welcome me in joining um, and turning this presentation over to Jana. Jana, it's all yours. Great, right. thanks Julie. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen with you all so that you can see my PowerPoint. Okay, somebody will let me know if that didn't work. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me today for Envisioning a Healthier Louisville, Dorothy Joseph's Mental Health Activism. And I'm really glad that the Filson is participating in Mental Health Month this year. Um, in recent weeks, we've really been focusing a lot on our physical well being, but I think at a time like this, it's just very important to remember that mental health is important too. And so it's a really good time to talk about a woman who did a lot to improve mental health care in our city. Uh, this is the Filson's first Mental Health Month, so I wanted to start just by telling you how this lecture came together. Uh, so back in 2017, I was doing some work cataloging a collection of Joseph family papers. And as I was organizing the collection, um, a lot of the papers were about a woman named Dorothy Joseph. And she had been a dedicated volunteer and worker in mental health services in Louisville um, for over three decades. And I was really struck by her story um, and the work that she had done um, from some things that had were going on in my own life. And so I ended up writing a blog post for the Filson about her. Um, I didn't really think too much about it after I'd written it, uh, but then you know, two and a half years um, on down the road, uh, the coordinator of Mental Health Month ended up reading that post and uh, she got in touch with me um, and we ended up deciding to put together a program for this year. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Dorothy Joseph's children, Fred and Susan Joseph, um, who both helped me in a number of ways with this presentation. Um, one of the things that they shared with me was an oral history interview um, that, that had been done with their mother. And so that really gave me a lot of insight into Dorothy Joseph's work. Um, and so I'm gonna quote from that a little bit during the lecture. Uh, this lecture is going to have three parts. So first, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about Joseph's initial interest um, and involvement in mental health care, um, and then kind of explore some of her motivations um, for becoming a volunteer and worker in mental health services. Uh, the second part of the lecture, I'm gonna get into um, a historical look at mental health services, um, particularly focusing on the time period from World War II to the 1970s. Um, when Joseph was involved in the field and really look at some of the changes that she was involved in over the years. Um, and then finally, I'm going to wrap up the lecture um, by considering how gender shaped the course of Joseph's life and career. Um, this really ties into the celebration of women's history uh, that we're doing in 2020. Uh, so I wanna start by introducing Dorothy Joseph to you. Uh, Dorothy was born in 1916 in Little Rock, Arkansas, and she grew up in the South. Uh, she was living in Miami when she met her future husband, Alfred Joseph Jr., um, who was a Louisville architect uh, down in Miami working on a project. And although Dorothy had many close friends in Miami, she and her husband moved to Louisville following their marriage in 1940. And soon after um, moving to Louisville, Dorothy becomes involved in mental health services. So I wanna talk about why she did that and kind of some of her, the influences in her life and her motivations. Um, so soon after 
Dorothy Joseph moved to Louisville. Uh, World War II um, broke out and the United States entered the war. And volunteerism really flourished during the war because everyone was anxious to do something to help the war effort. Uh, during the war, Joseph volunteered with the Red Cross and she was a gray lady at Nichols General Hospital in the neuropsychiatry ward. And on this slide, I have um, a couple of the buildings on the Nichols campus um, up for you to look at. Nichols was a regional psychiatric screening unit in South Louisville near Manslick Road. Um, and it mainly received casualties from the Pacific Theater during World War II. Um, the casualties would come in through the West Coast um, and be processed there. Um, and then soldiers would be sent to places like Nichols because they had family in the area. As a gray lady, Joseph worked directly with the wounded soldiers, providing personal non-medical care. And I just wanna read you a little bit of what she said about that experience. Some of them were in absolutely horrible shape, both physically and mentally. Some of the physical injuries were severe and many of them were hysterical. About all we volunteers could give the men in our unit was tender loving care. We would write letters for them, listen to them, go shopping at the canteen. That's what we were there to do. And so this was Joseph's first experience interacting with people who had severe psychiatric problems. Um, she found that she was very comfortable working with them and that she gained a lot of satisfaction from what she was doing. And so she became interested in volunteering further um, after the war in mental health. I want to consider also some of the other influences in her life that encouraged Joseph to become involved in mental health work. Joseph came from a family of women who volunteered. Both her grandmother and great grandmother were active volunteers in community work. Um, and then her mother in law, Helen Rothschild Joseph, especially inspired her. Um, Joseph actually lived with her mother-in-law um, during World War II um, and then uh, in a house next door for years afterwards. And you can see a picture of Helen Joseph there on your screen. Um, Helen Joseph was a woman who was very active in community affairs. Um, she was involved in things like immigration issues and women's suffrage. Uh, she was also a woman who didn't believe that women had to conform to traditional gender roles. I and mean, she really became an inspiration and a good friend to her daughter-in-law. Uh, she also was very much involved in an organization called the Natural, National Council of Jewish Women. Um, and she had been president of the organization in the 1920s. Um, and then the NCJW uh, was a group that uh, Dorothy Joseph also became involved in and was another important influence in her life. Um, so Joseph came from a Jewish background and following the end of World War II, um, around that time period, she became involved in the NCJW. Um, and the membership was very actively involved in charitable work in the community. Um, they did extensive programming, um, things like welfare, legislative, uh, educational, international and cultural programs. Um, and the NCJW was um, not an insular group, um, just focused on serving the Jewish community, uh, but really a group that had um, obligations um, and was involved in the wider local community. The NCJW um, considered or taught women to consider volunteerism a profession. Council women took pride in their work and they took it very seriously. Uh, and they saw themselves as important community leaders. Uh, I wanna share with you a statement from 1958 that really sums up how the NCJW viewed its membership. We have never underestimated the power of a woman. We know what a woman can do on the local, state, national, and international level. We expect mature decisions and conscientious work from our members. And because we know and demand the best, we are not often disappointed. <laughs>
Uh, Joseph was an active member of the National Council of Jewish Women for years. And you'll hear me um, talk about them more later in the lecture because a lot of the work that she did was in conjunction with that organization. Uh, and so from these influences in her life, um, Joseph kind of develops her own attitudes and philosophy about volunteerism. And I just want to share with you um, something that she said about being a volunteer. Volunteerism is more than just an activity. It is also a philosophy. To be effective requires a certain self-discipline. When you volunteer to do a job, an agency or a group of people is depending on you. You make a commitment you can't break. That's what volunteerism is. It goes beyond service. It is a way of life. Moving into the second part of the lecture, I wanna take a historical look at mental health care um, and really focus on the period uh, from World War II to the 1970s um, when Joseph was involved and kind of see and talk about um, what changes were happening over that time. So many of the mentally ill were historically patients in psychiatric hospitals. Um, and the idea of putting people in hospitals for treatment dates to the 19th century um, and ideas that came to the United States from Europe about moral, moral treatment for the mentally ill. And moral treatment held that uh, the mentally ill could be cured by appealing to the parts of their mind that remained rational. And Asylums were the place where moral treatment could occur. And so hospitals were constructed in secluded and peaceful country settings. Uh, by the 1870s, virtually all states had one or more state funded asylums. Um, you can see here on this slide, I have an image of Eastern State Hospital, um, which was one of Kentucky's asylums. However, the ideal um, expressed in moral treatment never really matched the reality. Um, asylums quickly became overcrowded. The Great Depression of the 1930s placed financial strain on psychiatric institutions um, and the quality of care really deteriorated um, during the 30s. Beginning in the 1940s, public support was mobilized for reform. World War II um, really sparked an interest in psychiatric reform. There were 1.75 million soldiers who were rejected for service on psychiatric grounds, um, and that really shocked the public. Uh, many of the soldiers returning from the war um, also suffered from um, psychological problems um, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and then in the 40s, you also have some influential works that are coming out. Uh, there's a book published called The Shame of States in 1948. And uh, that book cataloged some of the abuses that were happening in state hospitals. And then also in 1948, uh, there's a film that comes out called The Snake Pit, um, which is a, about a woman who wakes up in an, an asylum um, and is not sure how she got there. Um, and the movie really brought hospital conditions to life on the screen um, and focused public attention on some of the issues. Uh, in 1946, the National Mental Health Act was signed and the National Institute of Mental Health was created um, and begins to study how the mentally ill are cared for. Uh, moving into the second half of the 20th century, there begins to be a lot of experiment, experimentation with new service delivery methods um, and, tr and treating patients in locations other than the traditional asylum settings. Um, and one of the places where treatment starts to occur more is in general hospital psychiatric wards. Some general hospitals had historically cared for psychiatric patients, um, but treatment in hospitals really took off 
following World War II. Uh, the wards on, in general hospitals um, were short-term diagnostic and treatment units, um, and patients only stayed there for about an average of one week. By the early 1960s, general hospitals were admitting one and a half times as many psychiatric patients um, as the uh, old state hospitals. And so there's really um, an opportunity to start working with some of the patients on these wards. And so following World War II, um, Joseph begins to do volunteer work um, on the wards. And she really becomes um, not just a volunteer, but also an organizer. And she ends up establishing volunteer programs um, at several hospitals in the Louisville area. Uh, volunteers worked on the hospital wards and directly interacted with psychiatric patients. Um, I have an image up of Louisville General Hospital, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the program that she put together um, at that institution. Because um, it ended, it was the first one that she put together. Um, it's also the one that I happen to be able to find out the most about. Um, so it's the one I'm going to talk about. Um, so working with the National Council of Jewish Women, um, Joseph put together a program for the psychiatry ward um, beginning in 1950. Um, the first activity that they put together was a Halloween party. Um, and I found a quote in an article um, that said that this was the first time in the state that a group of well-organized volunteers worked directly with mental patients. Uh, to tell you a little bit about the program, um, one of the main components of it was an arts and crafts program, um, and patients made a variety of simple items, um, including things like baskets and pottery. Uh, patients could work on the crafts during the day or um, later in the evening, and this was something they could do to pass the time. Uh, they also uh, volunteers also did a weekly social hour on the wards. Um, they would bring refreshments, cigarettes, group games. Um, they would have community singing, um, or uh, sometimes they'd watch a movie together. Uh, they had a selection of over 80 favorite songs um, for the community singing that they put together. Um, and one of the volunteers would play requests on the piano. Uh, members of the group, volunteer group, um, would also stop by during the week. Um, they'd bring magazines and cigarettes. Um, it was the 50s. Nobody knew that was a terrible idea. Um, and then they would uh, listen to the patients. And uh, the goal of the program, as Joseph put it together, um, was to really assure patients that they were not forgotten or shunned by people outside the hospital. Uh, and uh, they saw contacts with the outside as vital to the overall treatment program. Um, Joseph very carefully selected and trained the volunteers who worked on the wards. Um, and she was looking for people um, based on their personality, dependability, um, and their previous hospital experience. Um, and she looked for people who worked well with others um, and were able to project warmth. Um, each recruit had an initial probationary period, uh, and then uh, they also did continued training sessions um, with the volunteers. Um, they'd bring in panels and speakers. Um, sometimes they'd hold workshops or um, watch films. And some of the speakers they brought in were psychiatrists, psychologists, um, and specialists in rehabilitation. Uh, so the program that Joseph put together at Louisville General Hospital was the initial project. Uh, she then went on to organize similar programs at the VA Hospital and Our Lady of Peace. Uh, she was also in 1955 um, involved with the Women's Guild at Jewish Hospital, um, in, which was recruiting and training volunteers um, to work in a variety of capacities. Um, Jewish Hospital had just opened a new building in downtown Louisville in 1955. Uh, the image on the right of your screen there is um, uh, some of the volunteer guidelines that were put together for that training. Um, 
Uh, so another major change in psychiatric treatment um, in the second half of the 20th century was dehospitalization, uh, moving people out of the traditional asylum setting in the, in the old state hospitals. In the mid-1950s, the National Institute of Mental Health um, is conducting studies that call for community care of the mentally ill rather than hospitalization. There are also more effective medications being developed at this time uh, that meant that some people were able to move out of the hospitals permanently. Uh, the first psychotropic medications uh, become available uh, soon after World War II, um, and you can see uh, their introduction there on the chart in 1955. Um, and so that chart there, you can also see um, in 1955, there were nearly 600,000 patients in the, in the country's public psychiatric hospitals. Um, and then by the end of the century, that number is reduced to less than 75,000. Um, and you have to remember the U.S. population is growing over this time period as well. Um, so it's a very dramatic decrease in numbers. Um, and some of the psychiatric institutions, uh, the old state hospitals are closing during this time period. Uh, so I wanna talk just a little bit about Joseph's work at Central State Hospital in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, kind of at the very beginning of this decline in patient numbers. Uh, Central State Hospital was one of Kentucky's um, old state hospitals um, founded, in the, um, founded in 1869. And um, it, it's located in Eastern Jefferson County near Anchorage. Um, in the early 1960s, Joseph was working at Central State as public relations assistant. Um, and this was a role that she was volunteering in uh, three to four days a week. Uh, one of the things that she, one of the trends she would have been aware of while she was working at Central State was that psychiatric hospitals were becoming more open to the community um, during this time period. In 1960, the commissioner of Kentucky's Department of Mental Health announced that state hospitals would operate under an open door plan. Um, and this meant that patients would be free to walk around the hospital and the grounds. Um, and his reasoning for the change was that modern drugs and treatment have made locked wards unnecessary um, and that there were therapeutic advantages um, for the patients in not making them feel like prisoners. Uh, and so in 1960, Central State allowed nonviolent patients to be out on their own. Um, and members of the local community uh, were really kind of nervous about this change. Uh, and so one of Joseph's roles while she was working at the hospital um, was to manage in incidents when patients wandered off the hospital grounds. Um, and as public relations assistant, uh, she talked to members of the community um, and really reassured them as they were coming into contact with patients um, that they didn't have to be afraid. Uh, another trend that was happening that Joseph um, probably would have seen some evidence of at the hospital um, was that a lot of the money is moving out of the old state hospitals um, and into other forms of care. Um, there's a move to kind of defund the old psychiatric hospitals. Uh, and so, you know, Joseph noticed while she was working at Central State that um, money was hard to find even for necessities like building renovations. Um, there was actually a place in Central State where um, they had a locked unit that was supposed to be totally secure, um, but the patients could um, climb through a panel in the ceiling and get to the outside that way. Um, and another thing she noted was that funds, uh, money was really only allocated for very, for basic needs. Um, so things like food, clothing, and medications. Um, and so another project that she worked on um, while she was involved with Central State um, was she was on a committee to 
uh, do fundraising and formulate plans to build a chapel at the hospital. Um, and this was going to be a place where patients um, could come to worship um, and have spiritual renewal. So during this time period where we were seeing a lot of patients leaving hospitals um, and instead being treated in the community, and there's a move to treat them in the community. Um, and there's a belief that treat, treatment closer to relatives and community um, was better than isolated and segregated treatment. And so you start to see the growth of something called a community mental health center. Um, and community mental health centers uh, assisted people leaving the hospital um, who often didn't have family support or didn't know how to function independently. Uh, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy signed a bill that offered $150 million in grants to states to construct community mental health centers. Um, so this is coming from the national level. Um, and the, goal, the number of uh, mental health centers and halfway houses is really increasing dramatically um, during this time period. In Louisville, the first community mental health center was a place called Bridgehaven. Um, it was established in 1958, um, so five years before President Kennedy signed that bill. Um, and Bridgehaven was a, another project by Joseph and the National Council of Jewish Women. In the mid-1950s, Joseph had become chairman of the NCJW's Mental Health Committee. Um, and it was during this time that she set up a, a series of study groups. Um, and these study groups identified a need to deinstitutionalize long-term state hospital patients. Um, and they really believed that uh, patients would benefit from day programs um, that would teach them basic social skills um, and help them integrate back into the community. Uh, Joseph did a lot of research um, in developing the program for Bridgehaven. Uh, she spoke with the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health um, about starting such a program and kind of gained his interest and support. Um, and then she and the committee also reached out to halfway houses in other cities um, in Philadelphia, Chicago, and New York. Um, and they researched um, the mission of those programs, um, what kind of programs they offered, um, and how they got their funding. Um, and they also uh, spent some time talking to people in Louisville um, and seeing what services were currently available um, to prevent duplication. Uh, so Bridgehaven opened in 1958, and the name was chosen because it was envisioned as a bridge for people as they adjusted to life outside uh, the hospital, and also as a haven as they learned to live independently. And Bridgehaven uh, was meant to bridge the gap between the hospital and the community. The first members of Bridgehaven were patients who had been released from Central State Hospital. Um, there were about 15 to 20 of them initially. I mean, it was an inclusive program. Um, so the, the first members were both male and female um, and, and black and white, um, which is probably fairly progressive for the late 50s. Uh, members typically came to Bridgehaven about one to four times per week um, and usually for several hours each day. Uh, you can see on the slide here, I have a picture of the first building um, that uh, Bridgehaven was located in. Um, it was a two-story house um, down near the University of Louisville. Um, and I actually, it was kind of interesting, I think it was on um, what was a fraternity sorority row at the time. Uh, there seemed to be a lot of college students in that area. Um, and the, the building itself is no longer there. Um, a lot of those structures on that street were demolished during urban renewal. Um, and you can see in the image here, um, they're doing some renovation work on the building. Um, and, and so a number of people were actually involved in um, getting Bridgehaven um, started and, and renovating the first building. 
Um, members in the program did a lot of work um, getting it set up. And then also volunteers and the local community um, did a lot too. Um, I also have an image of uh, Bridge Haven's current building um, on 951st Street. And um, I was interested when I was researching uh, their current building, I got really excited because I recognized the name of the architect. Um, and the Filson actually has some architectural plans for that building, which was just a cool connection for me. Uh, so I wanna tell you now a little bit about the program that Joseph and the National Council of Jewish Women created for Bridgehaven. Um, and the primary purpose was social rehabilitation. Uh, and so Bridgehaven's members were taught things that they had forgotten during their hospital, hospitalization. Um, they were taught how to greet people, um, how to use money, how to dress, um, and personal hygiene, so independent living skills. Um, they also spent some time uh, doing updates on technological innovations, um, so things that patients had missed um, while they'd been in the hospitals. Um, in 1958, uh, that included learning how to use a dial telephone. Um, and then uh, also part of the social rehabilitation program, um, volunteer interactions with members was vitally important. Um, volunteers represented the outside and their acceptance and friendship um, was vital to the program. Um, another component was uh, vocational guidance and training. Um, so Bridgehaven had a job training program uh, that helped members prepare for and find work. Um, at that time, uh, some of the skills that members could brush up on were things like typing, carpentry, gardening, and marketing. Uh, and then uh, a final component of Bridge Haven's program um, was that it was a place for recreation and entertainment. Um, members could come to Bridge Haven to socialize, um, they could play games, um, go out to eat at restaurants with each other, um, and spend time together. Volunteers were vitally important to the program. Um, and the staff was actually almost all volunteer at the beginning. Um, and I want to share with you um, from a 1958 article, um, just a little quote about how important volunteers were um, at Bridgehaven. The most important aspect of Bridgehaven is the feeling of acceptance members get from staff and volunteers. If the volunteers accept them, then the community will accept them. Uh, so Bridgehaven was a groundbreaking program. Um, it was one of the first halfway houses in the country. Um, it was the first of its type in Jefferson County um, and really one of the very early types nationally um, to, serve, to serve people outside of the hospital setting. Um, and so the program that Joseph established um, really was a model for others. Um, I have here on this slide, you'll see several letters. Um, these are all from the Joseph family papers at the Filson. Um, and these are from individuals and other organizations who are contacting her um, to, and because they're hoping to establish similar rehabilitation centers in their own cities. Um, so here you see I have letters um, written to her from Cleveland, Minneapolis, and Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and I just want to read you uh, one line from the Erie letter. That's the one on the far right of your screen, um, which says, We have heard much about Bridgehaven, which I have been told is an outstanding example of what can be done in this still experimental field. Over 60 years later, Bridgehaven is still helping people um, and is really a testament to the strength of the program that Joseph and the NCJW built. So I've spent a lot of time talking about the changes in the location of treatment 
of mental health patients um, from psychiatric hospitals uh, moving to community settings. But I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about how the ways that psychiatrists thought about mental illness also started to change during this time period. When Joseph started working in mental health in the 1940s and 50s, uh, something called the Freudian perspective um, was very dominant in the field. Um, and this held that mental illness was a symptom of the unconscious mind, um, often caused by repressed trauma or unresolved issues during development. Um, toxic mothers were often viewed as a root cause for mental disturbances. Um, also during this time, uh, a diagnostic treatment model was present. Um, and so patients were seen as people who were in need of diagnosis and treatment um, as problems to be solved. Um, and just kind of one example of that model in practice, um, a lot of the mentally ill um, during this time period um, had, were experienced lobotomization, um, which was an experimental brain surgery. Um, and there were about 40,000 lobotomies performed in the US in the mid 20th century. Um, and this has now been a discredited form of treatment. Um, so during Joseph's time in the field, um, there begins to be a shift towards a more holistic mindset, um, which acknowledges the contributions of dysfunctional environments, um, and then later on genetics in mental health. Uh, there also starts to be a shift to normalize people with mental health issues um, and to view them as being on a continuum instead of categorizing them as um, sick or well. And Joseph was an early adopter of the shift to normalize people with mental health problems. Um, she was a person who always saw patients as people um, instead of problems that needed to be solved. Um, she really cared about patients as human beings um, and saw them um, that way instead of as primarily a diagnosis or as a threat. Um, and as a volunteer, I think she uh, had uh, more leeway to think a bit differently than some of the established psychiatric opinion at the time. Uh, I wanna give two examples of this mindset in her work. And the first instance I wanna talk about is when she was interim director of forensic psychiatry in 1962. Um, and this was a role in which she was involved in the psychiatric evaluation of prisoners. Um, an important part of her position um, was creating a forensic unit at Central State Hospital. Um, and, uh, and this unit would provide expert testimony in a case um, or do psychiatric evaluation of defendants. Uh, and Joseph believed that it was very important for her to understand the patient's perspective to do her job properly. Um, the patients were viewed as very dangerous um, and Joseph was discouraged from going on to the wards, um, even if she had a guard with her. Um, but she ended up going anyways and talking to the patients because she felt she had a responsibility to them um, and that also as she, if she treated them with respect, um, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't hurt her. Um, and she was never attacked when she did that. Uh, another example that I wanna share with you about how Joseph cared for patients as people um, is her relationship with a woman named Helen Dorr. Helen uh, had been a patient at Central State Hospital um, who'd been a catatonic schizophrenic for 40 years. Um, and it was the availability of some of these new medications um, that brought her out of that catatonic state. Um, and Helen and Joseph became really good friends. Um, Helen would often come to visit Joseph in her office um, and they would talk um, and they really became very fond of each other. 
I want to tell you a story about their friendship. Um, so there was uh, one Christmas where a social worker at Central State refused to let Helen go purchase embroidery thread for a project that she was working on. Um, Helen was really upset about this. Um, she ended up coming to Joseph to talk about it. Um, and Joseph accompanied her um, to go purchase the thread. Um, and so uh, I just wanna read you a little something that Joseph said um, after she got her thread for this project. About a week after the holidays, Helen came up to my office. She had embroidered me a pattern on two guest towels. I thought that was the sweetest thing I had ever been given. I really treasure those. I still have them. Uh, and you can see on this slide here, uh, I actually have a note. Um, this is in the Joseph family papers at the Filson. Um, this is the note that Helen must have written um, when she gave uh, the guest towels um, to Joseph. Uh, and uh, circling back around to Bridgehaven a little bit, um, Helen was actually uh, one of the people who really inspired Dorothy Joseph to start Bridgehaven. Um, and Joseph believed that uh, Helen could be released into the hospital and could live in the community um, if there was a place like Bridgehaven that could help her transition. I want to, at this point in the lecture, come back to an image of Dorothy Joseph as an older woman. Um, and I think this image is just a really nice visual representation of the three decades of service that she gave to mental health care in our city. Um, it's also a nice place for me to be able to acknowledge that there was a lot of her work that I was not able to cover in this lecture. Um, she really did a lot of different things. Uh, so moving into the final part of the lecture, I want to consider how gender shaped Joseph's life and career. Um, and one of the first things I want to talk about is that um, her gender limited her educational opportunities. Um, gender expectations uh, kept her from pursuing higher education, uh, and she did not go to college despite being a very bright person. Um, according to her children, um, she did feel that she had accomplished a lot um, over her lifetime, but also that she could have done more um, if she'd had the benefit of a college education. Um, and so instead, she was a self-educated person um, and very well-read. Uh, as a woman, Joseph was also dissuaded from joining the workforce. Um, it was not typical for a woman of her social class and marital status to work. Um, and historically, uh, women would exit the workforce at marriage. Um, they were secondary workers who typically only worked if the family needed extra income. Um, and a family in which the woman didn't work was often viewed as desirable at the time. Uh, however, Joseph wanted something different than what the traditional gender role offered her. One of the things she said was, I had too much energy to just stay at home. I had a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, and so she moved into volunteer work. Um, and this was really a more acceptable um, avenue for a woman who wanted to be involved in public life at that time. Uh, in the National Council of Jewish Women, Joseph found a place where she could direct her energy and be a community leader. Uh, however, I do think uh, the contributions of volunteers uh, sometimes are less recognized because as a society, we give a lot of respect to formal education and professional training. Uh, much of the work that Joseph did over her lifetime was volunteer work, uh, which did not receive the same recognition. Uh, over the course of her lifetime, women's participation in the workforce did increase despite barriers. There are new sectors of the economy that start to form um, where there's work that's considered more respectable for women. Um, and by 1970, uh, nearly half of married women have joined the workforce. Um, and Joseph did end up 
of joining the workforce later in life. In the 60s, she's moving into some paid positions in mental health care. Um, and I'll read you one thing that she said. She really liked having some independence and earning her own salary. Um, she said, I wanted to earn my own money. I didn't want to be dependent on my husband for everything. Uh, and so Joseph had a groundbreaking career for a woman of her era. Uh, she built her career through the choices and the options that she had available to her at the time. Um, and she dedicated many years to improve, improving mental health care in our community. Um, and she was really a leader in the field. She found a lot of fulfillment in the work that she did. Uh, I want to read you um, just something she said about that. I never trained as a mental health professional, and I did not know a lot of people who are mental health professionals. There was a great need in the community for volunteers. It became my vocation. Over a period of years, I feel I've become a mental health professional, if not by formal education, by experience. And so I'm very glad today to have had the opportunity to recognize some of Joseph's accomplishments. Um, and by extension, um, also the accomplishments of volunteers like her who have done important work in our community. Um, that's the end of my lecture. I'd like to go ahead and turn it back over to Julie Skosky, and she's going to um, help me with some of the questions you all have had during the course of the lecture. Thank you so much, Jana. We'll go ahead and let you um, unshare your screen, and we are ready for a question and answer. So if you have other questions, please enter them in the chat. But we'll get started first with Jude's question. Um, what did the medical doctors, psychiatrists think about volunteers in the hospital settings? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, that's not something that I really came across in the course of my research. Um, yeah, I'd be curious. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I do think Joseph tended to work better with people um, who had a more um, holistic mindset about psychiatric care. And so I do think um, as a volunteer, um, you know, she did think a bit differently than some of the, um, uh, you know, people who are more of the Freudian perspective and, and the um, diagnostic treatment model. Um, and so she tended to work better um, with people who approach things more holistically. Um, and so I do think, yeah, um, I do think that, um, that there were certain people that she worked better with. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I, I think there probably was, um, some dynamic between volunteers and, and the professional, like um, psychiatrists and doctors on the wards. Okay, thank you. Um, next question uh, is from Madeline. Uh, she said, can I get a copy of Mrs. Joseph's philosophy on volunteerism? It was beautifully said. But that also gives me the opportunity to let everyone know that we are recording this session. So if your friends, family members missed it, we will be posting it to our website so that you can enjoy it again. So Jana, answer to that question? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd be happy to share that. Um, this was, that was uh, a lot of the quotes that I read were from the oral history interview that Dorothy Joseph's children shared with me. So um, that's something that I pulled from there. Um, I'd be happy to share it. Okay, so if anyone else other than Madeline would like that, just hit us in the chat and we'll be sure to email you that information. Okay, next question is from uh, Patrick. The, the building images that you uh, were able to share are absolutely wonderful. Um, how do you think the design of the structures moving from Central State to the Bridgehaven buildings mirrored the philosophy of care in each of these heirs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um you know, some of the images I showed from the old state hospitals, you know, they're in these 
kind of rem when they were built at least they were in these remote peaceful kind of country settings um, that were supposed to be um, just kind of a secluded and peaceful experience um, and then uh, the architecture of the new bridge haven building i really like actually because um just the the kind of curved architecture that you could see on the front of the building there it, it kind of evoked the image of a bridge to me um, and kind of that connection with the community i mean the, the newer community mental health centers are very much um embedded in the community and so they're um within this within the heart of the city. Okay, this uh, next question is also about um, Bridgehaven. So this is from Sarah. Uh, did a lot of Bridgehaven Haven patients end up uh, going into the hospital setting or did it have a high success rate? Was it above normal, do you, do you know? Uh, I, I don't know any numbers. Um, now I will say that when Bridgehaven started, it was really working with um, long-term hospital patients who were coming out um, of the old state hospitals. Um, and I do think um, that their mission has really expanded um, since kind of that early focus. Um, one thing I will say, I, I, I don't have any numbers, but um, you know, I think uh, you know, they, they were probably able to help a lot of people. Uh, the one example I do have actually is um, the woman I talked about, Helen Dorr. Uh, she actually ended up going back to Central State. Um, but I don't know that we have to think about that as a failure necessarily. You know, she um, was at Bridgehaven, um, tried to live in the community for um, a little while. Um, and, uh, you know, after some time, you know, the people who were working with her, they kind of all sat down together um, and had a discussion. Um, and kind of the outcome of that discussion was she said, I think I'm better off being back at Central State. Um, and so I think the port important thing to think about there is that, um, you know, there, there's not like a cookie cutter solution that fits all situations. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can care for people. Okay. Um, and this question is from Emma. Said it is interesting that films originally revealed the failings of mental health institutions and called for reform. In today's popular culture, it tends to be the opposite. Many films portray mental health facilities and the genres of horror and thriller thrillers, ghost hunting, ghost stories, etc. So how do you think the portrayal of mental health hospitals in, in film has changed over time and what impact do you think that this had on treatment facilities? And you touched on this saying, you know, that they went more community based, but your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the one film I, I shared, um, you know, they were really talking about some of uh, the abuses and kind of a negative portrayal of the state hospitals. Um, I do think that kind of, you know, that portrayal in the film did kind of um, spark a lot of interest in reform at that time period. Um, you know, I'm not so, I'm not as familiar, I guess, with some of the more recent films, unfortunately, um, to be able to comment too much on uh, how portrayals have changed. Okay, well, um, Jana, this has been so enlightening. And Dorothy Joseph was an absolute amazing woman. And so it is so nice to learn more about her. And we thank you so much for sharing this information. And uh, we want to um, also thank our partners that helped us get the information out about Mental Health Month and, uh, and this presentation and partnered with us on that. So we hope that everyone will join us again next week. And we hope you enjoyed your experience on Zoom. And we're getting a lot of chats about Jana, excellent pre presentation. So it was a great way to, to kick off this series. And thank you all very much for joining us. Okay, yeah, thank you all very much.